It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Sharon Minchak. Uh, I've been arranging for these forums now for a couple of decades, really. And uh, many years ago, Don Wadsworth, who most, most of you, many of you will remember, said to me, oh, my niece Sherry can do a forum. She's a geologist. And of course, we jumped at that. One thing we don't have in this community is enough geologists. <laughs> uh, we have lots of biologists and lots of astronomers and lots of other things, but not so much geologists. So I really jumped at it. This is the third time Sherry has come and talked to us. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, she got her degree in geology from Penn State, and we found out today that we were both born in the same city in Pennsylvania, Johnstown, <laughs> and a master's degree at New Mexico State, also in geology, and she's worked for 30 years now, is it? 31, yeah. At, at a company called Jacobs, that's a worldwide company that does all kinds of environmental assessments and, and other sorts of things, and she's based in Albuquerque. So she, she comes down here. When I invited her, she said, oh, good, I get to come to Portal, and, <laughs> and here she is. So we're, again, we're very, very grateful for that. Uh, if you wondered who it was that wrote the geology chapter in this book, it's Sharon Minchak. So with that, I give you Sharon Minchak. All right. Thank you. All right, is this working? This I have yep. all these microphones on. It's a little overwhelming. Hopefully I don't electrocute myself. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Carol. I appreciate it. As, as she said, I've been coming here, my husband and I and our children, who if, if any, I recognize some of the faces here and you'll no, you may remember our children who at points in the past had assisted me as my lovely assistants. Those children are now graduated from college and married and all of those things. So if that makes me feel old, hopefully <laughs> it doesn't make you feel too old though. Um, but it really is a pleasure to be back here in a place that I, I love coming. Um, we've enjoyed all of, you know, over 25, 27 years that we've been coming here and really gotten a lot out of this community. So it's great to have a chance to come back and contribute to the community. So we'll dive into it. Um, informal, I'm happy to answer any questions, anything that comes up. And as Carol said, we will have a walk tomorrow if people want to tag along on that. The more the merrier. So East Turkey Creek, a billion years of geologic history revealed. That's my attempt at a catchy title. Um, and before I start talking about the area specifically here, though, I, I feel like I need to give a little bit of level setting for what is the way geologists think about the world, which over my career I've come to learn is a little bit different than the non-geologists in the world, particularly when it comes to the idea of time and how long is long versus how long is really a blink of an eye. Whereas a geologist, you really think about time on the order of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years, in fact. And our perception as human beings of time to a geologist are a real blink of the eye. So to try to provide a little bit of a context for that, um, this is a way to sort of think about it normalized to a time scale that we typically think of as humans, which is in the context of one solar year here on Earth. So if you say that the Earth formed on January 1st, the reality is, is the age of the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, right? But if we say we started January 1 was when the Earth formed, it wouldn't be until November 17th, middle of November, that we had multicellular life actually arrive here on Earth. So little multicellular algaes swimming around in some sort of primordial soup. So 10 and a half months into the year, and in fact, it wouldn't be until the evening of New Year's Eve that you would have Homo sapiens arrive on the Earth. So um, that puts into perspective how recent we really are in this journey that the Earth has been on for billions of years. And it really wouldn't be until just a bit before midnight that we started to record time as humans. So when we think about 
time in the context of geologic periods and eras, it is really just kind of keeps you in perspective. You're going to hear me talk about rocks that are a billion years old that are right here in your backyard. You can go out and you can touch them and hold them, put them in your pocket and take them home with you if you want. Really, they're that old. Hundreds of millions of years is nothing. And some of the events that have shaped what we see here today most dramatically are geologic events that really happened fairly recently. And when I say recently, I mean 20 million years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but to a geologist, that's pretty recent. A few other things just to set us on a little geology 101. There are three primary types of rocks. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know all about these. One is sedimentary rocks, which are clastic, which means physical particles, or chemical sediments that are deposited in some sort of a fluid. That can be water, often is water, but it can also be wind, ice, um, those sorts of things. And then those things are cemented or lithified into some sort of an actual rock. The picture here I'm sure many recognize is from the Grand Canyon, the absolute poster child for beautiful layer cake sedimentary rocks that you can see and understand and visualize quite nicely. The photo, you can see that correlated with what are the actual geologic units that are seen in the wall. And then the stratigraphic section over there shows how geologists illustrate um, actual different types of rocks and the formation names. So sedimentary rocks, that's first. Igneous rocks, these are my actual favorite. I'm an igneous petrologist. That was what my master's degree was in. So I'm fond of igneous rocks. And those are uh, rocks that are derived from molten magma or lava. If it's molten rock that's below the ground surface, we call it magma. If it's expressed and extruded on the surface of the earth, like what's happening right now in Hawaii, it's called lava. Really cool. Don't doubt that I didn't think about getting on an airplane and going to Hawaii. And whether Bob and Linda are actually sad that they missed it just by a few days, I don't know. But I'm sad for them that they missed it just by a couple of days. So igneous rocks. And then the third are metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks mean just what their name says. They've been metamorphosed. They've been turned, taken, one they started as something and they've been turned into something else. How do they get turned into something else? A variety of forces that might act on them, pressure, temperature, stress, strain, um, regimes, and actually alteration from fluids and other materials that they come into contact with that might actually change the mineralogy of a rock and create a metamorphic rock. A metamorphic rock can start life as an igneous rock, it can start as a sedimentary rock, it can start as another, a, a prior metamorphic rock and be metamorphosed into yet another thing. So they are kind of the ultimate recycler. And then the last uh, concept just I want to touch on is the idea of structural deformation. The earth isn't a static thing, right? We have all these puzzle pieces of plates that are constantly jockeying and moving around our globe. And as they do that, we create stress, we create strains, they, they smash into each other, they pull apart from one another. And when you do that, rocks we think of as being hard and solid, but actually they can be manipulated pretty easily by the forces within the earth. And you either have brittle or plastic deformation. If you have a brittle for it, deformation, you actually are faulting, you're breaking the rocks, creating a fault zone. And actually the Turkey Creek wash drainage is a fault zone. The reason the drainage is there is because the faults are there and Mother Nature is really good at exploiting weaknesses in the crust's earth with water and wind and then creating drainages. You can see the offset that gets created when you have that faulting. Or you can have plastic deformation, which actually just lets you bend and shape and um, move these rocks, creating things like we call anticlines or folds, um, synclines, and that kind of stuff. And you can see both faulting and um, folding expressed in the Turkey Creek uh, drainage. So let's move on to then a little bit more about the specifics of what we got going on here, because you guys got a lot going on here. Portals is truly beautiful geology, and as Carol said, I'm from Pennsylvania originally. It's a lot harder to do geology in Pennsylvania <laughs> than it is to do it in the Southwest, because you just can't see those dang rocks nearly as easily. So. Um, 
call this a stroll up section of the East Turkey Creek and the Harris Mountain Fault. The reason I use the term up section is that as you walk from Foothills Road west along the drainage, you actually are going from the oldest rocks up through the younger rocks. And in geology, we call that up section. You're moving up section in time through the rocks, through the stratigraphy. And this is a great map. I have a tattered and torn version of this in my backpack that I always lug around when I'm down here because I may be a geologist, but I still love to get out my map and look at what's going on where I am. The um, actual Turkey Creek drainage area, you can kind of see the word Turkey and Harris Mountain Fault up there. That's the area that we'll walk along tomorrow and that the, the rest of the presentation details. These different colored sequences are what um, are all the different types of rocks and formations that there are. And this, the map itself is actually a USGS published quadrangle, geologic quadrangle called the Portal Quadrangle by name. So first stop, about a billion years ago, the uh, Proterozoic, what we call the Proterozoic era, and so as you walk along through the desert, you do, if you have anybody here that's hiked the Turkey Creek area, you get to a point where suddenly you're kind of out of the desert and you do sort of start to walk back what is the more structured wash area. And the rocks that you see there are these billion year old rocks. They're actually probably about 1.4 billion years old if you wanted to be technical about it. The names are the penile schist and a somewhat more generically named granodiorite. Granodiorite is a type of rock. And these are very old and you can sit on them. You can, remember my kids, 10 years ago, you'd climb up and down them and you'd sort of ski back down them because these are pretty beaten up. They're pretty friable. You can kind of smush them in your hands pretty easily and make um, gravelly grass, but that's okay. You know, they're pretty old. We'll give them a break. They've been around. They've been through a lot of different things. But I do find it really um, awesome, and maybe this is just me, but to be able to truly know that you're holding something that's a billion years old in your hands. So we'll take a look at this stuff tomorrow if you, if you walk with us. And I have to shout out to my husband. These are all his pictures. He's the picture guy over all the years. So his camera lens for scale. Um, so then what happened? Well, we don't know. And I can, you're like, yeah, that's the needle like scratching off the side of the record. You're like, really? One slide on the geology? And then you say you don't know what's going on? <laughs> what kind of a geologist are you? Well, what it is is, is uh, something that is a a pretty common thing that occurs in geology where, you know, all different places throughout the world, we call, the term we use is an unconformity. And that means that you have actually erased some amount of geologic time out of the, the rock record because of erosion, because those units, whatever they were, were subjected to erosion. They wore down, they washed away, and they literally are gone. Uh, high things tend to fall. The lesson I always taught my kids, gravity always wins, and it does. So things do essentially get, in, in geology, you can have situations and times and locations where essentially you've wiped clean that slate, um, and without the rocks to study, you have a hard time interpreting what has happened in that inner intervening space. Sometimes on a broad regional scale, you get a gist of what's going on because you can see in the, the correlating rock record in other locations that there was something, go, you know, what, what the area was, but you can't see it right where you are. And here in the portal area, as part of this unconformity, which is a pretty common one around the earth, call it the great unconformity, because it really marks that differentiation between those truly oldest billion plus year rocks and then moving into what we call a little bit our more recent eras of geologic time, things that are more just started like five or 600 million years ago. So in the portal area, we have about a 400 million years of the geologic record missing in that location. But have no fear, because we've got a lot of good um, records of that, of the time going forward from there. So the Paleozoic eras, the older 
the oldest part of what we kind of think of as the more modern geologic records from about 500, 520 million years ago. And when we look at this map, um, in the inset up here is obviously the global view showing what the various land masses that were present 500-ish some million years ago kind of looked like and how they were oriented on the globe, at least relative to the way we choose to think about the globe being oriented, which who knows why if that's right or wrong. It's just the convention we've adopted over time. Um, but you see that, and then obviously this is a, more of a, a regional map that, of the area here. You can see the outlines of Arizona, New Mexico, the Four Corners, and so on. And the green circle down here roughly depicts about where we are here in the portal area. So when you look at this, you can see that to what would have been the east um, from where we are now, that you did have an upland area of mountains, of land, you know, the out of the water land. And what we were, where we are was sitting in sort of a relatively near shore kind of beach um, environment slightly out into the water, depending on where you were in time um, over, and over this time period. So that was, this is what we call the Cambrian period. And the rock that we have a really great expression of in this area is this unit called the Coronado Sandstone. So the little shorthand there, CCQ, the, whenever you designate a geologic unit, you always start by designating the time period it's from, which is the first letter. So the capital C correlates to the Cambrian period. Uh, the little c correlates to the name Coronado. If you find and describe a unique new uh, geologic unit, you get to pick the name. Sometimes people name them proper noun type names. Um, and then the Q. The Q actually is in this case specifying that this is a quartzite. Now we use the more generic term Coronado sandstone. When we use the term sandstone, what we're referring to is actually the grain size of the material, the, the grains that are part of that sedimentary rock. A, a sand-sized grain is about 0.05 to 2 millimeters in size. But it doesn't mean that that actually has to be what you and I might think of as sand, as silicon dioxide. Um, it could be anything. It's more the size. But in this case, this, sand, it, this sandstone is actually made of quartz sand particles. And then even furthermore, it's cemented with quartzite cement, which means that it's pretty doggone hard. If you go up there and you hit this with your geologic hammer, you better be ready for that hammer to bounce back in your face, because that's probably what it's going to do. Um, and this has a unique uh, feature that you can just see really a lovely expression of up Turkey Creek, and that you do have these basal units, so at the bottom of these different sedimentary layers, where you see these much thicker um, these, well, these beds that have these much larger cobbles, pebbles in them. And then as you move up through that, that section, you can see there's a couple of them that you can see on the larger scale up there. You see that it returns to a finer grain sand. We call this a fining up sequence, moving from coarser grain deposits up through smaller grain sizes. And then you see that cycle repeat. And what that tells us is happening, happened in this spot that this rock used to be in or was initially formed in, is that it was at the edge of a shoreline. It was in that beach area. And that in time, over time, as we so certainly all know, if you live in Florida, or you live in the, on the coast, you know that shorelines aren't static things, right? At a given spot in time, in, in space, that if you stand at the edge of a beach and you see a river or something coming into the water, into the larger sea or the ocean around you, that as it initially hits that larger water body, the various sediment that might be being carried by that river starts to drop out. And as that energy bleeds off entering the larger body of water, the first things that that water can't carry anymore are the coarsest grained materials and so they drop out and as you move further further out into that water body you see the smaller 
grain sizes eventually be what is being dropped out of the water stream and deposited. And that's what this is showing us. So it's showing us that at a given spot that you actually have the shoreline, you're seeing the geologic record that's showing you that shoreline moving back and forth from that very mouth of, an, of a delta entering the river or entering the sea to a point when that, that was out a little further. We call that retrograding and prograding shorelines. So it's kind of cool to actually be able to see the movement of that in um, this rock unit. So we'll move along a little bit to the Devonian period, about 360 to 400 and some million years before present. On the, on the global view, beginning to see a little bit more of a hint of things that might look like the way we envision the continents to be today. And you see that here in regionally, we are still sitting here on the edge of sort of a, a land water interface. But the topography of that upland region has de decreased relative to the relief that we saw in the prior map. Um, and it's also kind of contracting. This is during the Devonian. The portal area was really sitting in kind of a shallow, warm sea area. And that created the opportunity for the deposition of some really nice limestones. In the, of the Devonian period. Um, it's called the portal formation. The D, obviously big D, correlates to the period being Devonian. These are brachiopods. These are crinoids um, that you can definitely see in these rock formations. You gotta look a little bit. You gotta poke around. You gotta find some nice ones. But these are uh, fossils that I've, I've seen and collected here in, out of this formation uh, in the past. And it does tell us about the, the environment that and how that, that, where that was sitting in, not only relative to sort of the shallow sea, but also what was going on in the world there. Because limestones are um, a sedimentary rock, but they are chemically deposited. So you're, you're depositing, precipitating out of the water calcium and carbonate to deposit limestones. And Carbonate has, and carbon dioxide behaves differently than a lot of uh, materials in the world in that usually things are more soluble in warmer liquids, right? Um, car calcium or carbon dioxide doesn't behave that way. If you've ever had a glass of warm soda pop, it's pretty flat. It's because the carbon dioxide actually is more soluble in cold water than it is in warm water, which is why you see limestones often deposited in these warm, shallow equatorial seas, um, which is also then a great place for all these little, little um, animals to, and plants to thrive. So that is what was happening with the portal formation during the Devonian period. We cruise on ahead a couple hundred, another hundred million years or so into the Permians. Globally, you definitely, I'm sure, are beginning to recognize some of the, the Pangea, Proto-Pangea um, formations and also see that it's sort of things are swinging into space on the globe the way we think of these land masses being oriented. Here's the local portal area again showing we're sitting squarely in this nice um, small, this nice shallow offshore environment, but you also see what is beginning to be an expression of more dry land sort of wrapping around this area. Why is that happening? That's happening because of some of the funkiness that's going on with the plates over here on what we would call the western margin of the United States today. You're beginning to get things subducting, plowing into the west side of this land mass. And as you do that, you're beginning to lift and accrete things onto the edge of this land mass, you're actually creating more land, um, which gets even ramped up even further as we move along in geologic history. And so this area is now not just sort of sitting really hanging out very pleasantly and happily in a, in a shallow limestone location, but you're see it's starting to get more of a mix of sediments that are coming off that says that sort of wrapped around uplands. So this is a nice expression of two units here out of the Permian, um, the Horkia limestone. We've 
talked about limestone in the ERP formation, which is really a silty shaley um, unit, red-brown sort of shaley unit. You can see the differentiation in the photo here of the limestone beds and the intervening um, less resistant, more incompetent. We don't mean that rudely. Uh, it's just the term we actually use for, for rock formations that aren't, aren't as sturdy um, is uh, incompetent shales. And just as a little bit of an a, a offshoot of how a geologist needs to think about where they are in the world when they're trying to look at the rocks, ironically, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania, I'm from the East Coast, Though, honestly, I've spent a lot longer time here now than I did ever there. Um, but back on the East Coast, places like Pennsylvania, places like Florida, its limestone is highly subject to weathering and erosion and dissolution, right? The carbonic acid you have in natural rainwater will dissolve and work away on limestones, and you get karsts, and you get sinkholes, and you get that kind of stuff. On the contrary, in the arid Southwest, Limestones are quite resistant to uh, chemical erosion because we don't get a lot of rain. <laughs> and we don't have a lot of water constantly moving through them. So you see those actually be fairly, resist be fairly resistant beds that can actually be important markers that you look for in the geologic record. So then what happened again with the unconformity? My apologies on that. I, I wasn't here making the, the rules about how, what was getting eroded or not eroded at this time period. But again, since it is a more recent than that great unconformity that was billion years ago, we do have a little bit better sense of regionally what was going on that tells us where we were and what was happening. You can see the portal area was very much in an upland land mass area that was being subjected to erosion. This was during the Triassic and the Jurassic period. The bummer here is that it is the Triassic and the Jurassic period. And if there's one geologic period that the lay people probably recognize the name of, it's Jurassic. And that's why, because there were dinosaurs. <laughs> So, oh, alas, no dinosaurs here in the portal area, but of course it's not too terribly far regionally into New Mexico and up into Colorado where you have some of the really classic formations where, that are just chock full of dinosaurs like the Morrison Formation, but not here. And that's all right, we can understand that and, uh, and have an idea of what was going on during this 100 million-ish year gap in the uh, geologic record locally. So the Mesozoic era, uh, the, the eras I was just talking about, Permian, De Devonian, um, Cambrian, those are what we called the, proto the Proterozoic, um, and, or I'm sorry, Phanerozoic, and then we move on to the Mesozoic era, and the first um, stop here is what we call the Cretaceous, 60, 60 is five to about 130-ish million years before present, um, you definitely are starting to recognize the shape and form of the global map now, right? It's not exactly what it is today, but it's definitely getting a lot closer to that. And here you see in the portal area, we're sitting here in this extensional basin, um, still a fluvial or water, generally water dominated type depositional area. But on the western margin of North America here, we're beginning to get some pretty serious tectonic activity that is happening. We are subducting what was a, a predecessor to what we would call the Pacific Plate today, um, beginning to force that, actually force that plate down underneath the North American Plate. And that's beginning to really just start ramping up what's going to be some pretty fun times over the next hundred million years or so. And the portal area is sitting right there. And so in that sort of braided stream, deltaic, near shore, upland, river, fluvial, low, um, different sedimentary environments, we have the deposition of what's called the Bisbee Group of sedimentary rocks, Centura, the Mural, the Merida, the Glance conglomerate. 
These are sedimentary rocks. They tend to be a little bit more river dominated than the sea out in the ocean or a shallow sea dominated. And of course, I'm sure that folks recognize the name Bisbee um, and associate that with copper mining. Hold that thought, we'll come circle back to that in a little bit. Um, I'll also make the point that in this case, so this is the Cretaceous er period, geologic period, we've already used C for the Cambrian period, which was the Coronado sandstone we talked about. So we talk, we, geologists use K for the Cretaceous. Where you might have heard the, the, a K used is if you've ever heard somebody talk about the KT boundary as the boundary point where the meteorite asteroid, you know, crashed into the ocean off the Yucatan Peninsula and brought the dinosaurs party to a pretty quick end. After that, based on the environmental changes it made, that's what you're talking about. It's the boundary between the Cretaceous period, which then sort of marks the transition, a pretty significant transition in what we particularly look at is the, the fossil record um, in geologic time and the tertiary period, which is the next one. Um, but what was also going on in the Cretaceous, and this is related to that tectonic activity happening to the west, is really a ramp up of volcanic activity in the region. Um, and there are some really lovely sets of, of, of expressions of beautiful basalts that you can see, and basalts are the type of lava that is actually erupting you know, in Hawaii now. It's that dark black fluid lava that you think of see you know, running down across the roads and pouring off the edges like uh, syrup into the ocean. And there are some really nice expressions of, of basalt throughout um, this area. And, but as you begin to develop basalt deeper into the mantle because you're shoving this plate down into that hot mantle, it works its way up. It becomes, you know, you have these rocks that are getting subducted down in that begin to melt. Different minerals melt at different times, different rocks, depending on how much water there is or isn't things. And that, that melt starts to percolate up. It starts to creep its way up. It starts to work its way through fractures or faults or different things that you, different we, areas of weakness. And in this case, this is really cool. This would be, if I was like doing a Geology 101 uh, test in a, a, a Rocks for Jocks class somewhere, I would use this, this exact um, rock face that is up in Turkey Creek as an example to look at the cross-cutting relationships. The rocks on either side are that billion-year-old granodiorite, and then you ramrodded this Cretaceous basalt right up through a crack here, and you see it very obviously cross-cutting through, but you're juxtaposing things that are almost a billion years apart in, in the, the right next to each other, which is pretty cool. And some, uh, some other really nice basalt flows, a lovely picture of my sister from a very long time ago on that rock. Um, along with this volcanism and all this activity that's starting to happen, you do see the folding and the faulting associated with it. You begin to see uh, impacts. We can see this locally up Turkey Creek, whether it's uh, brittle failure here in a fault zone. You can see the, the folding in those rock units that are pretty easy to see when you're standing there. And this is in, a, in association with that subduction that's happening along the western North American co coastline. Um, at that point, Arizona would have really been what we would have called the coast, the west coast. C uh, California had literally not arrived yet. It eventually arrived on the conveyor belt with that plate being subducted. Um, and this is really associated with what we call the Cordilleran orogeny. And orogeny, keeping this G, is what geologists call mountain building events. Um, and the Cordilleran is the name that we apply to this phase of mountain building, which is a broad North American uh, mountain building event that actually we more generically call the Rocky Mountains. 
So the Cordillera and Orogeny was beginning at this time frame um, as all of the West, really, of the Western U.S. was beginning to fire up. So then we move on to the Cenozoic Tertiary. I mentioned the KT boundary. This is the T part of it. And now the globe is looking pretty darn familiar. And um, even the reality of the regional picture is beginning to look more familiar to us. But as I said, we do still, you know, you could have Western or Western Arizona could be beachfront property, but no more. But this is where things really start to get spicy around here. This tertiary volcanism that really starts to set in. And this is really the culmination of this subduction as you just plow this plate deeply, deeply down into the mantle. You create significant l more melts. Um, and that begins to rise up and accumulate, amalgamate into some very large magma chambers in the crust here, here throughout the southwest. But here in the um, portal area, for sure, you have large underground magma chambers. The Hughes stock is, is visible over further to the west. And this is really um, what is a massive amount of volcanism that is really firing up about 25 to 30 million years ago and will go on to be really a, a key item that shapes what we see around us today with the Turkey Creek volcanism and, and ultimately the caldera. So some of that magma that is being, that is coalescing and um, becoming these large underground chambers of magma do go ahead and start to erupt out onto the ground surface. I sort of think of um, a large magma chamber in, in this kind of um, instance as a big po a pot of big, really thick oatmeal sitting on the stove, sort of starting to bubble. And if you've ever boiled a really thick, big pot of oatmeal, you know, it sort of sits there and kind of looks like it's doing nothing, but if you still have the heat going into it, eventually it starts to sort of burp some big blobs of stuff out um, onto the stove around you. And that's what this, these rocks, you know, what truly are the most iconic, right? Your Chamber of Commerce looks as you look out at Silver Peak and all of these things and Cathedral Rock are these really, really beautiful Silver Peak Day sites and Cave Creek Rhyolites that were erupted in this area in that, you know, 25, 26, 7, 8, 9-ish year, million year ago time frame. Um, gorgeous, beautiful, and certainly what you all have the pleasure of getting up and taking a look at almost every day, but there was still more to come. And that's when things definitely got um, a little uh, difficult <laughs> if you had property in the portal area circa 25 million years ago. Um, the Turkey Creek Caldera. So I mentioned this big pot of oatmeal that's sitting there. Well, yeah, it's a big pot of oatmeal. And as it, it kind of becomes a self-sustaining event, right? You have this subduction going on. You have magma rising up out of the mantle. It's growing. It's continuing to feed a large magma chamber. And then you have this large hot magma chamber, which is also then beginning to sort of eat into and melt into it the rock that it's, it's sitting inside of, the more local rock. All of these things that we've just talked about from these other hundreds of millions of years, the limestones and these sandstones. And as you start to take what is inherently sort of basaltic lava and you begin to melt this local country rock, that's what we call it, country rock, into it, you change it. You change it chemically. Um, you change the mineralogy, you change all of those things, and you also begin to incorporate a lot of dissolved gas and fluids into it, and that continues to make it a bigger and bigger pot of goopy, gloppy, bubbling oatmeal. And you have it down below the surface of the earth, and you sort of have it sitting in this pressure cooker, right? Because you've got it covered and you've got it contained. But just like a pressure cooker, 
you can get things hotter and you can get things under a lot higher pressure inside the pressure cooker. But if you were to take the lid off of the pressure cooker, you're going to have everything come spraying out. And that's exactly what these magma chambers basically bring about their own demise because as they're eating into this and melting into this country rock, they're doing it vertically as well. And so they're beginning to eat their own roof melt their own roof off of them, and you suddenly reach a point where that overlying rock just doesn't have the strength and the ability to contain the pressure inside that chamber, and the whole thing basically just blows up, literally, in a very violent caldera forming event. Um, that is what the Turkey Creek caldera was. As a frame of reference, the Turkey Creek caldera um, probably collapse of that caldera probably ejected about a hundred, um, about a, yeah, about a hundred square miles of material, a um, hundred cubic miles of material in volume, and it probably covered over a thousand square miles of area. So you really had a pretty big mess and relative is a, a frame of reference to an eruption that most of us have at least some sense of uh, an understanding in in the context of what have been our human lives this eruption would be about a thousand times larger than what mount saint helens had been so would have created a, a massive regional impact absolutely would have created a worldwide effect there's no doubt whatsoever about that and you just would have had these massive pyroclastic flows, ash flows, ash falls that would have been extending just for you know hundreds of miles all around us. This is a picture of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines when it erupted, um, and that's the kind of thing you would be looking at if you had a front row seat. Though you wouldn't last very long. I heard a um, an interview with a uh, somebody that was a commander in the army that was stationed with a geologist when they were anticipating the Mount Pinatubo's um, eruption. And at one point he said the geologist looked at him and said, sir, you better put some jam in your pockets because we're about to be toast. <laughs> they ended up surviving, but you do know that if you were there for a massive pyroclastic event like this, you were certainly taking um, a pretty good chance of, of not, not being around to tell the tale. So it was these huge pyroclastic ash tuff deposits flows that are what make up the rock formations that we see in the Chiricahua Mount Monument today. Um, those tuff deposits are what are, have been eroded into the spires and the hoodoos and the really funky looking things. We don't see it here because it has eroded from this area, it's still it present, it's still visible in the monument because that was the portion that was still inside the caldera, inside the, the hole that was left. And so it hasn't had a chance to be have the, the topography be high enough that it's all eroded away yet. But that is definitely was um, a big to do when this all went down. And, you know, people talk about Mount St. Helens, people talk about Yellowstone being a super volcano and all those sorts of things. Right here in your own backyard, you had a super volcano that, that did its deed um, with, uh, 25 million years ago. So not only did, of course, it eject all this material, but this is a pretty big deal, right? This, this causes more than just, you know, barfing out a, a thousand square um, <laughs> miles of, of material, it creates a massive amount of faulting and folding and reactivation of, of old faults and all sorts of things. Picture that you've made a hole that used to contain all of this material. When you suddenly evacuate all of that mass out of that, that location, you have the edges 
of it begin to slump and slough and they collapse back in on themselves. You have all of the, the actual just concussive force of the explosion that happened. You have all of these fluids that are associated with these magma chambers that are shooting out into the rocks all the way around. This is the geologic cross section through that Turkey Creek area. And you can see you've got some of these big old stuff. You've got some of this young stuff in the used stock. And in the part that we'll hike in tomorrow, you just can see that you have shifted and shaped and slumped and slided all these different rock units that have been, had been deposited and emplaced over hundreds of millions of years before. The repeat of the colors obviously is correlating those, you know, correlate to one another. And you can see that you have just really structurally deformed them significantly with the faulting that's going on. The other thing though that is relevant here is that you do have all of this hydrothermal fluids that begin to move out throughout the rocks in all of these areas. And um, they're highly mineralized and they're highly aggressive. And when I say they're aggressive, I mean that they're super hot and they also tend to be extremely acidic. Um, so they, as they move through rocks, they scavenge uh, materials, they scavenge elements, they scavenge metals out of the, the minerals and the rocks that they're moving through. They carry them, they interact with them. And as they're doing that, they then go on and move on to other locations where eventually you have then changed though, you have returned to something a little bit more normal as far as pressures and temperatures. And then all that material gets redeposited. And the lucky rock units that were a place that was a really good repository for that scavenged copper and other minerals and other metals was the Bisbee Formation. So you have native copper, in some case actually real porphyritic copper, which would be the coolest thing ever to actually find in the field. Um, lots of copper bearing minerals and ores, malachite, azurite, things that you see here. Lots of actually quartz crystals, whether you see it shot through in these sort of veins in the rocks or if you've ever been up to Crystal Mountain, you've, you can find really beautiful crystals like this that were deposited. You get a lot of alteration. A lot of the rocks around here, you see this very um, apple greeny sort of epidote alteration. That's also an effect of the hydrothermal fluids. So the Bisbee Formation is sort of this famous formation. The actual uh, sedimentary rock units that were about 100 million years old were kind of, you know, not super exciting until they had this secondary mineralization event that, that happened, you know, 75 years, 75 million years later with, in association with the Turkey Creek caldera activity at the time. And of course, created a really important economic um, geologic unit by our human standards, at least. Um, and is, is certainly something that you all know uh, well and was important to this region for sure. So that kind of brings us to the end of what we think is sort of the historic uh, geologic time before we enter what I call modern time. And by that, I mean about a million years to now. Um, which is what we call the quaternary period. The, and so you see lots of expressions of quaternary geology going on. The show must go on each and every day, right? Whether it's outwashes and washes and sediments that are, are who here doesn't know about how rocks and sediment get moved by the rain when it does occur here. Bob especially knows <laughs> of late. Um, we have trees, we have plants, we have animals for that matter that their roots grow into things. We exploit cracks. You see things move that help all contributes to erosion, contributes to other things. We have, uh, you know, gravity still always wins. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, you have the rock, you have the creek out here with big boulders rumbling down it when the, the water really gets going and all those things. So when we look at quaternary geology, we look at what's going on around us here today. 
that actually brings into focus for what, what is a real tenant of geology um, that was first put forth by James Hutton, who practiced in the 1700s and who we call the, the father of modern geology. It was a, the concept is uniformitarianism, and it boils down to a pretty simple statement, which is that the present is the key to the past. So the things that we see going around, on around us today are the same things that went on around this globe um, 100 million years and 500 million years ago. And when we look back at a geologic record, and I tell you that 500 million years ago, the Coronado Sandstone is tell, it tells us that that used to be a near beach formation, and you can see how that, that beach head moved back and forth, you could say, that's crazy, you're making that up. How would you ever know that? Well, I know that because I can go and I can look at beaches and I can look at the way those sediments are deposited today. I can look at the way um, sedimentology and all of the complex math that is around fluid dynamics and sediments that are carried and how they're deposited. I can look at all of those same physical processes that we're able to feel and touch and see happen in front of us and study, mathematically understand. They're the same things that have been acting on this earth for all 4.5 billion years old. And so we really do look at what, how, you know, you might think where our heads are stuck in the rocks hundreds of millions of years ago, but it is through the clues and the way we understand the world around us today that it, we have access to look at those much older rocks and have them actually tell us a story, a timeless, ageless story when you think about it in the context of human lifetimes. And so that's one of the things I think is most cool about geology and what I love about the fact that I have the opportunity to do it as my job, but also really do it um, as a hobby. And this is one of my favorite quotes that's attributed to Will Durant, but you know, civilization exists by geologic consent, subject to change without, um, <laughs> without notice. And that really truly is true because just as we talked about the Turkey Creek caldera, I mean, geologically, do we have a situation of a Turkey Creek caldera erupting in this area today? Um, no, but is that opportunity and all those physical processes still in place um, on this globe? And will it happen again? It will. Will there be earthquakes? There, there will be. Will there be barrier islands that move in the, in the face of hurricanes? Absolutely. That's the way the world works. That's the way geology works. And when we give us some contemplation to geologic time and we give some we juxtapose that to our human timelines, you know, maybe it makes us stop and think a little bit about how we actually fit in this geosystem and what we want to do. Because there's one thing I can tell you, the earth, she's going to be okay. She's tough. She's already been here for 4.5 billion years and she will be um, for another 4.5, how we make our mark and how we as a species think about our time here is what we have some control over. And maybe, at least for me, when I think about that in the sense of this broader system, it helps me put things in perspective a little bit. So um, with that, I think that's all I've got. I appreciate your time and uh, happy to... Answer any questions if anybody has any. If you've had enough geology, I'm happy to let you get to the cookies too. Well, Yellowstone is a pretty interesting spot. <laughs> <laughs> Helen. Yeah, um, I spend a lot of time looking at drilling records for wells all around here now that I'm uh -huh. in real estate. Yeah. And also water quality reports. Yeah. And I've noticed that the wells on the south side of Coral Road that are up against the mountain, they're all they're all in limestone. Yep. And um, there's some and the guys when they drill they have to write down what's what mm -hmm. is coming up, which yep. is fascinating. They have this whole profile. Yep. But there's something that they often report called black limestone. What is that? Well, so it, I'm, I'm certain, I don't know exactly what formation it would be, but it is, it's certainly one of these limestone units. And the way it presents itself in drill cuttings is, you know, I mean, limestone typically is pretty dark gray 
and, and can get, you know, can be quite dark. And so what it is is that, you know, a, some, a driller, and, and this happens, I mean, I've worked with a lot of drillers in my life, and, you know, you want, so they may not know the academic side of the geology, but they darn well know what they see coming out of the hole because they've been doing it a lot. And so whatever marker bed that is, it's something that is, you know, pervasive, absolutely, and they probably know that that is where you're penetrating into what's, I believe, a confined aquifer. Um, if I think about what I know Bob and Linda's well is, is and how it was drilled, where you're, you're penetrating into an aquifer, a hydrogeologic zone, which is pretty good water, um, pretty productive, and pretty good high-quality water. So they know what they're looking for, and that tells them when they're deep enough, because as you can see, based on the different deformation and different folding and faulting, you might it, you can't just necessarily say it's always 200 feet below ground surface. You're really looking for that marker bed to define where you are in the geologic record. Mm -hmm. Can you use rocks to identify old river drainages or creek drainages that have changed uh, over the years, and also changes in the monsoon? Because our monsoon, they just really realized recently, is more dependent on, er, erogeny has affected our monsoon more than like the Indian monsoon and other places. Yeah, you can. So you can certainly see in the geologic record, you, you can see the evidence of historic drainages for sure. And again, it's that's where you say, well, what I see now and what I see in the past or what I see in the past and how does that help me interpret what I'm seeing now, you certainly see um, where you've had erosional features, you know where you have folding and faulting, you know where you have these zones of weakness, which is then often where you do see drainages be created. And as you see changes in the deposition of, you know, um, what maybe was bigger boulders that used to roll down, um, the creek here and that doesn't happen as much anymore or maybe it happens a lot more you'd be looking for those changes in the geologic cycle uh, in the stratigraphy that would be signaling to you potentially what were climatic changes that were impacting the way rains monsoons or those sorts of things were happening um, with regard to the way the monsoon pattern has been impacted here in the southwest um, that probably, it, I, I wouldn't be surprised that our mountains and the way that jet stream has responded in response to some of the climatic changes we see going on has changed and is a little bit different beast than say the Indian monsoons. Now theirs is heavily dominated by the mother of all mountain chains at the moment in the Himalayas, but to some degree that is a much more monolithic um, feature right now, which has probably preserved some of the way that pattern looks for them. There's uh, a couple of spots here when you're climbing up in the, in the hills uh, where you find aggregations, sometimes no higher than your waist, but long embankments that go into the ground that are, they look like somebody glued together, you know, 50 million round balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you cut into them, they actually have a little a little crystal form inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just wondering, I, when I saw them, I said, well, maybe they were formed like you form uh, pellets, shotgun pellets, or something where you have a long tube, you fire stuff up, and it's, it spins as it comes down and cools, and that's how you get the shot. Makes, yeah. Yeah, but w what is that? Well, I have... Um I have two thoughts. So there is one of the one of the formations, and I, there was a picture of it. I didn't talk about it very much, though. Is um, a, a rock formation called a conglomerate, which is a sedimentary rock, which is made up of a lot of fairly big cobbles um, that are all smushed together. Um, but that what you're describing really does sound like it may be more like the thing, the stuff that's going on on Crystal um, Mountain, where you are really actually looking at the quartz um, 
geo they're like geodes right or crystals i mean sometimes they're they're they have a cavern in the cavity in the center and or you see the crystals those would be parts of that that those hydrothermal fluids that were associated with the turkey creek um caldera and um some I'd, of them are have a nice oh i'd say the size of a lemon with uh -huh. little crystals all on the inside yeah other ones are almost solid with just sort of the hair <coughs> just a little bit of crystals and they're just Amazing, just the whole solid. A whole solid, be a form. bunch of them. Yeah, that would that would be cool. I'd love to see where some of those are. I mean, I've been up on the Crystal Peak and seen those, and yeah, it, it does kind of looks like a spine almost of them. Like once you get you find it, you can kind of follow it along. Some of them fall out. Yep. Mm -hmm. on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's all. That those would that was primarily quartz. There might be a little bit of calcite that's associated with that, and would be from the that vulc that period of volcanism. Yep. Where is that, right? Up where the, the, the newspaper petroglyph is, or the cowboy uh, petroglyph, and then there's a whole cliff that goes right around into that. It's, huh? a, it's a height, but it's yeah, huh? it's not a big deal. It's right here. It's not too far from oh, our house oh. visually. Okay, cool. I think you have... I have this sort of simplistic idea that we've got limestone underneath and volcanic stuff on top, but there's and the, so the fossils should all be underneath. But then there are places like up Snowshed Trail where there's fossil spring. Uh -huh. and, and are there really fossils? I mean, if, is there really limestone up there with fossils in there? And if so, how, how does it get way up? There, there probably is. I'm not quite exactly sure where you're talking about, but um, there is. And if you think about that cross section I showed where you saw all those like slivers of stuff that was with those different layers that are turned almost up on their end, that is the way you, you take things that seem like they fundamentally should be down, right? Because gravity always wins, but you've taken them in through the tectonic forces is that you've actually elevated them up into the air um, or to quite a higher topography in Albuquerque, if anybody's familiar with Albuquerque, the east side of Albuquerque has the Sandia Mountains on it. And the Sandia Mountains represent a, um, as the, it's the edge of the Rio Grande Rift, and as that rift has been pulled apart over time, you've taken these rocks and you've, uh, you've actually kind of tipped the whole edge of it back because you've released the stress that was holding it. So the very top, the very top really clear layer that you can see at 10,000 feet above sea level is a limestone that's filled with fossils in Albuquerque. So that's the way you you can turn the geologic record upside down through structural changes. Howard? Uh, the reddish, pinkish, purple hues of the rhyolite. Yep. Due to iron, potassium, what, what elements caused that? The, the primary culprit, the coloration of that pink, and whenever you see that those pinks, that is usually um, the mineral plagioclase, which is a type of feldspar, which is a sodium potassium silicate. Um, sodium potassium. Yep. Feldspar. I can remember feldspar. Feldspar, <laughs> right. <laughs> Feldspar is a cool mineral, uh, the actual mineral, because it's a it's a, an almost complete solid solution. So depending on whether you are at the sodium and the potassium end, or you're at the calcium and magnesium end, you have quite different coloration in it. But that's a little geeky geology. What color is calcium and magnesium? Is the of, of the pledge of a feldspar? That's a almost white, almost clear crystal. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Harris Mountain, when you walk up the road in the rocks on the side where the road was cut, there's sponges, uh, petrified sponges or whatever. Yeah. And, um, so what period are those from? So those would be from the Devonian, and that would, I'd love to know where that is, because I have seen mention of that in the geologic literature, that there are some fossilized sponges that can be observed here. and. Oh, very cool. That's a that's a really nice find. That is, those are cool. Bob showed me something. He, he found um, 
The other last night he was showing me it's a beautiful ammonite. Again, those are hot. those are not things that you happen across in the fossil record all the time. So there are some really nice specimens well, around. Oh, okay. And, yeah, on the side. and on the side where the rock cuts, about probably from a third of the way up to about uh, three quarters of the way up. It's all. Oh, very cool. Very neat. Yeah, very cool. So, yeah, so that would be probably, probably the Devonian period, which would be about, you know, 400, 3 to 400 million years old. So, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. I um, would like to thank you very much for a very yeah. wonderful Oh, well, thank you.